Super Talk Mississippi media production. Let's talk a little college football. We've been off this track a little bit. We've been so hyper-focused on Mississippi State lately. I want to get back out on a little bit more of a national side of things. Mike Golick Jr. joins us, uh, hosts the uh, Gojo and Golick podcast with his dad. What's it like working with your dad, by the way? Uh, you know what? It's one of those things, thankfully, I've gotten to do it for so long right now that it almost feels second nature. And, and I think it's a lot like anyone else's relationship with their parents. It, it's awesome most of the time. And then we also know each other so well that every once in a while, like, we'll notice the thing that we've noticed since I was a teenager. And that'll get us sidetracked a little bit. We know how to kind of nitpick each other and play yeah. ways that can be entertaining. So it, there's it's so overwhelmingly the the cool part of it. And I think leaving ESPN and kind of getting an appreciation of not knowing if we were ever going to have that chance again after we got done with Golik and Wingo there to get a chance to do it here and kind of hold the pen again together has been a pretty cool experience. But trying to explain technology to a 61-year-old man who has no earthly interest in learning how to use it is my daily struggle. Mike, I just went to the cable company to drop off a check for my mom to pay her cable bill, and I'm just like, what what am I doing? Like what, mom? We have this thing now. You don't have to do this, but yeah, never oh, mind. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. All right. I want, we talked earlier on the podcast this week about time frames for new coaches, sure. and you know, in this day and age of college football, when you can flip your roster so quickly, you know, it used to be you hired a new coach, and then when his guys were juniors and seniors, that's when you really would judge him. I don't feel like it's that way anymore. In your mind, how long does a new coach get? at a program to, to start reaching whatever the program's expectations are. Well, I, I think that that last part you mentioned is probably the biggest part are what are the expectations? Like you can look this year at the highest level. Kalen DeBoer is taking over one of the most difficult, but also storied, well-funded, supported jobs in college football at Alabama where they're not used to losing. The stat I saw the other day of their – Coaches poll ranking at number five being their lowest since 2009 was a mind blowing reminder of just what they've been. And so I I truly don't know, like if they were to go on the road and lose at Wisconsin this year and drop three games overall on their season, he's probably walking into year two on the hot seat based on what can happen to these programs. So I I think programs like that, some of the higher level ones, it might be different than other places where it's all right. Hey, I don't know exactly what the school's NIL budget looks like. I don't know how positioned they are to play in these ways. And if you're not a school that's going to be able to go out there and try and money with people to oblivion, you know, see on the other side at Ole Miss, the way they've gone about their business using that and using the transfer portal, then I do think you still got to give guys three, maybe even four years to try and set a foundation and sort of counterculture what's been the modern program build for college football. So with that being said, three huge college football programs this year are in year three with their coach. And, and you know, there's some connection here, obviously. Notre Dame, LSU, and then USC, who Notre Dame plays every year, all year three of, of their head coach. What's their baseline expectation for this season going to be? If all three of those schools aren't in the college football playoff, are, they, are their coaches in trouble? Yeah, I I think that's realistic. I I think you at least start asking questions in all three cases, right? Because if you're Marcus Freeman at Notre Dame, it's been the steady build of recruiting for the last three years. You've portaled quarterbacks each of the last two years. You're trying to play the game. You overhauled your wide receiver corpse here. You brought in a big-time offensive coordinator and Mike Denbrock from LSU. And so you've got to now, I think, take that next step. They were under Brian Kelly at the end of his tenure, a team that made the four-team playoff a couple of times. And so... I think that's the baseline where Notre Dame fans can feel good about the continued trajectory of the program, provided they're in the playoff. And I think with their schedule this year, they're positioned to probably win a game in the expanded playoff now, which is going to be another interesting way. Like, do we use that as a measuring stick more so than, hey, you made it with 12 teams. Congrats. That would have had us in, you know, the Peach Bowl before this. Now we need you to actually win a game there. Brian Kelly, kind of similar, like, Hey, LSU is a different breed of animal in terms of program. Like we talked about the big time expectations. When your last three head coaches have won a national championship, and when you're Brian Kelly, who left Notre Dame pretty much admittedly so that, hey, this is the last thing you really need on your resume for a guy that's been a great coach at a bunch of different levels, left Notre Dame beating Newt Rockney's win total before the vacated wins thing started. Getting that national title under his belt is what he came to LSU to do, and so that's the standard when you're at a place like that. And then, uh, obviously, Lincoln, he's had Heisman winning trophy 
Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks that he can basically pull out of the couch cushions like pocket change at this point. And so uh, seeing, hey, now that they've seriously decided to start addressing the defensive issues that have plagued him for a while on that side of the ball, can they take the step forward? I would say he's probably got the most leeway. And I would say of the three, just again, because of the program we talked about, their expectation, Brian Kelly's in the most interesting situation to me. You just had the Heisman Trophy winner last year. You got draft picks left and right still, but you're at a place where the expectation is national championship based on the talent on your roster. Is there still a place in college football for a quote developmental program? I know people are going to point to Clemson for this one. You know, that where they're not using the portal at all. I think when I say developmental program now, I mean a program that still they go to the portal, but it's when they really need a I have a hole to fill. They they need a starter right away. They're not looking to bring in 15, 16, 17 guys from the portal each and every year. They they still want to build through high school and try to keep those guys on campus. Does that thing still exist in college football? Yeah, I think so. I think quite honestly, most of the best programs in college football are kind of living like that, where the players they bring in the portal, I I, I say they're garnishes because they're not the bulk of the meal. They can be expensive and incredible garnishes, right? Like you look at Caleb Downs going to Ohio State. That's not a small thing by any stretch of the imagination, but the bulk of the roster and the reason we talk about them so excitedly is the guys they've got coming up the recruiting pipeline, the guys they got to come back that were on the team last year and, and forsake the NFL. George has been the same way. Alabama was that way for the bulk of the end of the save and tenure. Even Steve Sarkeesian, who, you know, had to portal a bunch of receivers this last year and has picked and choose there. Certainly it's about what they've done as far as the depth of recruiting along the offensive and defensive lines there. You could look at a program like Utah out West. That's getting ready to join the big 12. Like I think that's how Kyle Whittingham's gotten down. It's been a development program that wants to work along the lines of scrimmage still. So yeah, I, I think those programs are there, but you can't just be any one thing. And I think that's the difficulty for Clemson right now is they're still going to be a very good football team. They were the face of the college football playoffs first decade. So it's a bit of a step back from that, but you can still do that. I just, think you've got to kind of mix and match both to use the tools that you've got at your disposal. You know better than most that the offensive line is where development is is the most key. It's really difficult to just bring in offensive linemen year after year. You've got to have those guys in your program for a bit, you would think. So I'll put a a question into your wheelhouse. Who's the best offensive lineman in college football this year? Ooh, it's... So in my mind, it's like a flavor of ice cream choice mm-hmm. as I'm getting ready and going to look at some Bob of these guys. Kind of, is, is what I would go with. Oh uh, yeah, you know, listen, that's not a bad one either. I like yeah. I, I'm all good options here. I'm the Thank son you. of a type two bi- diabetic. That's the son of a type two diabetic. So you're speaking my language. But I hear you. I um I I would say Will Campbell at LSU, their left tackle, or Kelvin Banks. They're two very different players, yeah. both incredibly effective. I'm probably a little bit partial to Kelvin Banks just because, you know, yeah, he's still an incredibly young player, but going into his third almost full year as a starter, he got there immediately and was an impact guy for them. And just athletically, the things that you watch that guy put on tape week in and week out, there's just only a handful of human beings on earth that can do the kind of things that he can do movement wise, matching the skill of some of these dynamic edge rushers on the perimeter, what he does when he gets out in space in the screen game that Sark's like Sark likes to use. And just, I I feel like with that, knowing his youth and then the development ceiling that I think is still there, he's a guy that's really exciting to look at both at this level on a line where Listen, Texas returned four of the five starters from a group that was part of the strength of that team last year, and he's the best one on that group. So I think those two guys right near the top, if you told me either of them was OT1 come this spring, I wouldn't be surprised. But of the group I've seen so far, those two are studs. When I think about the SEC this year, then somebody if somebody were to ask me how many teams can win the SEC, I mean, I think the number is like six. I think there really are. This is the deepest the SEC has been in a, in a long, long time. What about the Big Ten? How many teams can realistically win that conference? Oof. Uh, the Big Ten at this point, I would say there's that upper crust of four that I would probably truly trust in the Big Ten right now between, obviously, Ohio State and Oregon at the top to me are fascinating. Like I, I There's part of me that wants to pick Oregon to win the Big Ten this year, just looking at Dylan Gabriel and who he profiles as a quarterback, then bringing back the bulk of a line that I trust more than Ohio State's, the offensive weapons there, Dan Lanning's defensive pedigree and depth of recruiting. Like, 
I think they're truly capable of it. Michigan, I know they lost a ton of talent. I know they've got the sign stealing stuff staying, hanging overhead for them, but I, I like Sharon Moore as a head coach. We'll see if he's, you know, if they get the NCAA violations in time to actually have him suspended for any of the season, if that's on the table. I, I don't know, and I don't think it'll actually affect this year. So they've been good about restocking the coffers there, even when they've given up a bunch of NFL talent in the past. And so I think they could still be froggy there. And then, listen, I know we do this every year with Penn State, but the talent on this roster that's there in the backfield already, Drew Aller, what people want out of him as quarterback, what they've done defensively, Andy Kotelnicki coming over as the offensive coordinator from Kansas is one of the most interesting hires in college football for me, just because if you didn't tune into a Jayhawk game at all last year since Andy was there, um, under Lance Leipold, it's a laser light show. There is constant movement. There is so much done to help in a way that a lot of people looked at and didn't think was necessarily there for a Penn State offense that seemed allergic to taking chances down the field last year. And so I, I just wonder if you combine all of that ability with an offense that's going to structurally put defenses in a more compromised position, if this could be a chance for them to you know, get over the hump now that the playoffs have expanded. I don't think they're better than Oregon or Ohio State by any means, but they're talented enough and with that coaching change mixed in there under James Franklin, I do think they're an interesting team. Let's finish it up with a talk about Mississippi State and Jeff Levy. Everywhere this guy has been offensive coordinator, Central Florida, Ole Miss, Oklahoma, he's been consistently good. And when I, not just good, but in some cases elite. He turned Ole Miss from a team that they couldn't score when, before he got there to one of the best offenses in the country. Every year he has a great quarterback. Every year a receiver comes out of nowhere to catch 60, 70 passes for 1,000 yards. What is it about this particular style of offense? I guess the the, the generic label is veer and shoot. What makes it so, so consistently good? Yeah, I, I think pace and space. Like I know it's it's sort of reductive and we hear this all over, but – you know, you look at the heightened forms of this offense. I think the purest, most uncut version of it lives in Tennessee right now, where you've got these guys so spread out for that. But it's just really hard to defend when the offense has speed and pace as a tool. And I remember when Brian Kelly first came to Notre Dame, it was one of the hardest training camps we had ever been through because originally he wanted to be a pace team. And you don't realize going through camp while you're sweating it out and dying out there each and every day until you get to that first game and you look across the sideline and the other team's hands on hips and you're sitting there going, oh, wait a minute, that's why we did all this, where you recognize just the advantage it has right now. So I think that's certainly a part of it. And then being able to connect with the quarterback, I think, is always a a good place to start with this. And you've seen the work that he's done with quarterbacks at all the stops that you mentioned there, being able to simplify the equation for the quarterback and allow them to make quick decisions, allow them to make decisions that put defenses in a bind. I think all that stuff collectively, when you can simplify the formula for your quarterback, but complicate it for the defenses, then you've got a winning recipe usually. That's interesting to hear you talk about the, that those practices at Notre Dame because we, we talked to Lebby yesterday and he, he, he sounded not frustrated, but you know he was talking about needing to clean up pre-snap and, and, and you know try to, to, to get things a little cleaner. And I just thought, I wonder if they're having trouble with the speed that he wants to play at. And I mean, does it does it, just from what he's saying there, does that sound like what he's saying? Yeah, I, I mean, that's – and anywhere that you've had people that want to use up-tempo offense, in, in whatever form that is, right? I mean, there's so many variations of it. Calling it like a hurry up or up it, – it's there's so many different versions of that now, just the same way that there were so many versions of the Mike Leach air raid tree. But I, I think the one thing you always hear from places where they're implementing that is there's so much that has to happen from the time the ref blows the whistle after the play to the next play for you to be able to get that information in fast enough to be able to go process read whatever the defense is showing you quickly like I hated it as an offensive lineman because I like to clear picture we were going to figure out hey especially where was the double team on the line how are we going to combo where are the linebackers at and sometimes when you're going fast you have to learn how to work with a muddy picture up front in a way that to me was counter to what I had always been comfortable with at the position so that's one example on the micro of what everyone and listen just in general for these guys some of them are on their third offense in a you know yeah. a matter of years like yeah. I had four offensive line coaches in five years when I was at Notre Dame and 
trying to implement each new coach's technique while also doing the things that make you successful as a player that you've picked up from each of the last ones. It, it's difficult for the players. It's difficult for the coaches because for some of the guys on this team, for Jeff Levy, you're not going to coach veterans that are expected to be your bell cows the same way you're going to coach a guy that's coming in young and green that you have a chance to really put your fingerprints on. Some guys you're just polishing. And so going about that, yeah, there's always going to be, especially at the beginning, some rough days in that process there. But it's just about weathering the storm and keeping guys' heads up long enough to believe in what you're coaching them to where they get to see reps that all of a sudden reinforce that. Really good stuff, Mike. Really appreciate your time. Mike Golick Jr., check out the Gojo and Golick podcast. If you don't, you're missing out. It's a great podcast. Uh, Thanks for your time, man. Appreciate you. Hey, thanks for having me. A Super Talk Mississippi media production.